I've been invited to talk about my new book, The Aristocracy of Talent, How Meritocracy Made the Modern World, which was published uh, a month or so ago and which is available now from all good bookshops. Uh, and I was specifically asked to address the question, how fares meritocracy in Britain and Europe, competence or cronyism? And I feel that I have a very mixed sort of feelings about uh, that question, because I think there is an enormous amount that worries me about the state of meritocracy in Britain and Europe. There are enormously powerful anti-meritocratic structures, uh, sentiments and tendencies. But, you know, for example, I, I, I do think that we have one of the weakest cabinets of my lifetime. We have a pattern of cronyism, particularly in the in the dealing with um, COVID and the purchasing of medical equipment and uh, masks and the rest of it, which is very, very disturbing in an advanced society. And we have, of course, declining levels of social mobility compared with the, the post-war era. Um, but there is also, I think, a very good bit of news here as well. And that is that there is the making of a meritocratic material uh, revolution, that there are the materials for a revival of meritocracy, particularly in this country. So uh, an ambivalent picture and one that's, that, 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 that's sort of infused with a certain amount of hope. And may I say also that if I'm, uh, if you can't hear me or if there's crackling or if there's disturbance on the line, please shout and we'll try and do something about it because I know Zoom can go terribly, terribly wrong. Let's start off with the bad news. And I think if you look at politics uh, in this country, at the political class in this country, you see that Britain is the victim of two very serious things. One is a very long term decline in the quality of the political class, in the quality of politicians, in the quality of, as it were, our collective ruling elite. Um, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, I think every constituent part of the country, every sort of dominant social class was in the habit of sending its best people into parliament. So you had in the aristocracy, if you look at the aristocracy, you had people like Churchill going into parliament. If you look at the, the working class, you had these extraordinary figures like Nye Bevan, and Ernest Bevin, really the products of, of self-education, of the trade union movement, uh, people who'd had a real life outside parliament um, and who were really very, very skilled and very capable of organizing things. And one of the reasons why so much was achieved in such a short period of time after the Second World War was that these people were just big figures who were used to doing big things and didn't stand any nonsense. And thirdly, you had a sort of intellectual class, the educated middle class, who sent their very best people into parliament. So if you look at the Wilson government of the 1960s, you had these extraordinary figures like Crossman and Crossland, um, who'd been dons at Oxford, who were exceptionally well-educated, exceptionally bright. Um, you had, I think, six um, people or even more who had the first class degrees from, uh, from, from Oxbridge colleges, particularly Oxford colleges uh, in the Wilson government, including of course, Wilson, uh, Wilson himself, who got alphas on every single one of his uh, papers, apart from moral philosophy, where somehow he fell down a little bit. Um, so you had, um, you know, this long-term tendency. And now if we look at um, our, our politicians, they're distinctly second class compared with that. Partly, I think, because the best people are no longer going into Parliament. They're going, uh, they're, they're tempted by the process of money making, you know, the rewards that you can get from going into the private sector, particularly the city, are just astronomically bigger than they are in, uh, in, in the political world. Also, because of the process of globalization and more and more talent is looking for global careers, either emigrating or spending at least a significant amount of time in other countries, particularly, I think, United States, also, also Europe, but also working for companies whose focus is primarily global rather than national. So I get a sense that, that talent is, is going elsewhere. It's not going into politics as much as it could. And what talent we do have going into politics, we are not making the best use of. Uh, and I, I, I can't refrain here from, ma from making reference to Brexit, because since Brexit, the Conservative Party has, impl uh, has imposed an ideological litmus test on its um, 
cabinet members uh, on its recruits to higher office. And you either have to change your mind, bend the knee in the way that Liz Truss has, or you have to have been um, Brexiteers from the word zero in order to get um, serious uh, cabinet office. So we've lost a whole generation of very able, moderate, pro-European uh, MPs, uh, people like Rory Stewart, I think, who in, in many ways intellectually was the most able of the lot, certainly in a man of extraordinary articulacy and varied experience. Sam Jima from, I think, near where you are, um, you know, left first for the for, for the Liberal Democrats and now has left politics entirely. You have something like, like Philip Hammond. So a whole succession of either well experienced, competent people or up and coming people and a pattern of appointing Brexiteers, some of whom are bright, but many of whom are not that bright, simply because they happen to have had the right political views at the right time. So this combination of a long term structural decline in the quality of, going, of people going to Parliament and this sudden impact of Brexit um, is, um, I think, very worrying. Um, and a lot of this has been driven by the rise of populism. Populism um, comes with a, a suspicion of what might be termed the cognitive elite of the educational uh, educated elite. Obviously, you know, one, one is constantly reminded of Michael Gove's quip about the evils of experts. But I think that sense that know-it-alls, experts, people who, who um, have a certain level of educational qualifications are, because they have that level of educational qualifications, bound to look down on ordinary people and therefore shouldn't be favoured by the electorate, has done damage to the Conservative Party, just as uh, the rise of the, the sort of the militant Corbynites has done a great deal of damage to the Labour Party. So this populist revolt against um, against the, the the cognitive elite, so against the educated, has the uh, cause problems. But I also think, and I think it must be admitted as well, there's a problem on the other side as well, that the European community, um, I think, is too enclosed. It's too divorced from ordinary people. It's too dominated by an educated elite. It's too willing to say that people who aren't part of the cognoscenti, who aren't part of the inner circle, who aren't residents, as it were, of the Brussels bureaucracy, shouldn't be listened to and should be treated with suspicion. And it's also too willing to take um, second rate politicians, national politicians, and to give them another career. And I think the quality of, of uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, um, is questionable, was questionable. Certainly he had a, a, probably more than the right level of affection for the bottle. And I think uh, von der Leyen, again, uh, was not a great success as a German, def uh, as German defense minister, has all these accusations, I think true, correct accusations of plagiarism against her. And I think the habit that the, the, the European community uh, the, 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 the Brussels, uh, the, the permanent bureaucracy in Europe has of um, marking its own homework, not listening to the populace, uh, turning everything into a game of insiders is a problem. And I think these two things, on the one hand, this populist revolution of which Brexit was a massive manifestation, but not the only manifestation, and the insiderish nature of the European community and the, cr the cronyism of the political elite appointing other members of the political elite have reinforced each other and have brought out the worst uh, in each other. We wouldn't have had the populism if the European Union had been more um, open and more willing to listen to criticisms of it. And we wouldn't have had um, the, um, the break with Europe that we've had. And we also wouldn't have had Europe being as insensitive and as sort of defensive um, of criticism as it has been, if it wasn't for the fact that it was dominated by a very narrow clique of people who very distinctively lack uh, intellectual diversity. So I think we have a crisis of meritocracy um, in the political system, a declining quality of leadership, um, a rise of populism, a rise of a cognitive elite which doesn't look outside itself. And all of these things reinforcing each other and leading to this terrible paroxysm, uh, paroxysm which was, which was uh, Brexit. Um, the second problem we have, I think, with social mobility, 
uh, with, with, with meritocracy is the rate of social mobility has declined in this country. You had this big outburst of social mobility after the Second World War, um, right the way through the 40s, 50s uh, and 60s. And that at the end of the 70s and after that has seriously declined. Uh, and I think that's one of the most depressing things that's happened um, in my lifetime, my parents' lifetime, was that what was becoming a more open society has recently become a more closed society. And I think that the reason for that are many, but one of the things that's, that's happened is that we've had a peculiar marriage in this country between what I, I would term the old aristocratic class, people who were born with money on the one hand, and the new rising meritocracy on the other hand. You've had these two groups of people sort of merging with each other. The old aristocrats have become more meritocratic and the new rising people who did well out of the, 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 the 50s and 60s have become, as it were, more like aristocrats in the sense that they've become more entrenched, more defensive of their social positions and more cunning in the way that they preserve their privileges. They become opportunity hoarders at the top of society. And I think two great revolutions have really consolidated this, this period of opportunity hoarding in Britain. One was the destruction of the grammar schools. The grammar schools have provided a great avenue of upward social mobility for the working classes and for the middle classes. I remember when I went to, to, to Oxford uh, in the late 1970s, it was an increasingly meritocratic institution. It was an institution which was really becoming dominated by the, by the grammar schools, the number of people from the state sector was going up, uh, the number of people from the private sector was going down, and then all of a sudden, all of that changed. Um, the, the public school people started to increase in numbers, the grammar school people started to disappear, and the reason for that was that we had destroyed the grammar schools by the comprehensive revolution. Whatever the intentions of the comprehensive revolution, it actually reduced levels of social mobility, uh, it uh, re replaced a, a, you know, an examination system of selection with a system of selection by postcode lottery, essentially. Um, and it meant that, um, that, 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 the, the state, that your likelihood coming from a state school background of getting into the elite was reduced. And at exactly the same time that we were going comprehensive in the state sector, the public schools were becoming more meritocratic. They were becoming more academically selective, more academically rigorous, more academically focused. So the Eton of the 1950s and 1960s was a comprehensive school for posh people. The Eton of the, 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 the 1990s and today is basically a grammar school for posh people. It's a very much more meritocratic school. Also the case with Winchester, also the case with, with, with Westminster, St. Paul's and the rest of them. So two coincidental revolutions, the state sector becoming less meritocratic through comprehensivization, progressive education and the rest of it. The private school sector not becoming entrenched, expanding and also becoming much, much better uh, it's examinations much better at training people. So what we've seen is a society that was opening up uh, in the 50s and uh, in the 40s and 50s has been closing up, has got less social mobility, has got opportunities hoarded at the top. That's a very, very bad sort of uh, social, social development um, and the worst sort of thing that we, you know, the sort of thing that we really don't want to have. So two very depressing developments going on at the same time. One is that the quality of our political elite has been declining. Secondly, that the level of social mobility has been declining, that we're getting opportunity hoarding uh, at the top of British society. So in other words, a less meritocratic society, a society with less social mobility, a society in which the aristoc aristocracy, the upper classes are using meritocracy to preserve their position and are not being challenged from, from people coming up from below. And I think many people might say, well, you're, you're exaggerating here that meritocracy is simply part of the way that the world is organized. You can't get away from meritocracy. It's just a natural way of organizing the world. I don't think that's the case. I think it is very seriously possible that we're actually regressing in terms of meritocracy, that we're going back 
to a more closed society. And I would say three things to those people who say meritocracy is, 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 is the default position of modern societies. I would say, first of all, that if you look around the world, Many, many societies are not meritocratic, have not been meritocratic. And if you look across the Atlantic at the United States, you have a terrible example of what happens when you begin to abandon basic meritocratic principles. You have, you know, Trump was surrounded himself with his members of his family, with people who weren't qualified. He overrode the, 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 the professional qualifications of the administrative class and surrounded himself by, by cronies. So I think that that is one possibility. Second, if you go back in history, if you look um, just a couple of hundred years ago, you know, meritocracy wasn't here. You know, jobs were bought and sold on the market. Jobs were inherited. Jobs were given away through mechanisms of patronage. Meritocracy was something that came very late in human history from the 1850s with the opening up of the civil service to open competition and examinations in the 1870s with the opening up of the army, getting rid of the purchase of commissions and opening it up to, to talent, um, something very recent um, in human history. And finally, if you look into human nature, if you look into your own hearts, you realize that we're not in our nature meritocratic animals. We're animals that prefer to look after our children first. We might say meritocracy is great, but just let's make sure that my own child, my own children gets an advantage, gets that job. So we're willing to, to pull wires for our own for our own families so meritocracy is something that has to be fought for in every generation has to be recreated in every generation and has to be um we have to guard against you know people who want to fix the system people like ourselves who want to to, to fix the system so for both of these reasons because of the nature of our political class as a declining somewhat degenerate class and because of the way that opportunity hoarding is present push itself to the center of British society and we've lost a lot of the mechanisms that used to provide upward social mobility for uh, poorer people people from less privileged backgrounds um, I think there's a lot that needs to be worried about in our society and I don't, I don't think this is peculiar to Britain I think you're seeing this right across Europe uh, Britain's a particularly bad example I think levels of social mobility are lower in Britain than any other advanced country apart from the United States, but we are seeing a common development right, uh, right across the world of people who are well off hoarding their wealth and of the quality of politicians um, being less than one would like. But I now want to go on to my more optimistic thing. I don't want to leave with the impression that I'm a complete pessimist because I'm not. I think there are a few reasons for, pe for optimism and a few reasons for thinking that we can actually push uh, society in a better uh, direction. One is that in education, we're beginning to see the closing of the opportunity gap, of the meritocracy gap between the public and the private sector. I think we have a number of exceptionally successful academy schools uh, in, the, in Britain. The academy movement has been one of the best movements the uh, best initiatives that we've seen in education since, uh, since the Second World War. You have things like the London Academy of, e of Excellence in Stratford, the Moshbourne Academy in Hackney, and of course, Brampton Manor in, in East Ham. And Br the Brampton Manor School in East Ham routinely now gets more children into Oxford and Cambridge than Eton College does, despite the fact that the majority of its students are uh, ethnic minority, and that the majority of its students, I think, have free school meals. Um, so poor people proving their abilities by being offered the opportunity of a, of, a, of a school based on excellence and aspiration. And I think th this is beginning to, this movement is really gaining, gaining um, momentum at the moment. So I think we have some other very optimistic developments. I think we're seeing um, a number of private schools um, by which I mean, you know, big public schools um, forming close relationships with state schools and acting as sort of mentors to state schools. Eton College has recently signed a deal with uh, the Star Academy, which has 20 academies across the country, whereby they'll share teachers, they'll share expertise, they'll bring these children into Eton for summer schools and things like that. I think Winchester, St. Paul's, um, Westminster are doing similar sorts of things. 
Uh, and we're also seeing universities beginning to um, play a more active part in improving the quality of, of, of public school education. Um, I, I mean, state school education by that. Um, setting up math schools. I think uh, King's College London has set up a math school. Exeter University has set up a math school. So the education system, which was you know, characterized by a lack of ambition or, or, or sort of a revolt uh, against excellence in favor of equality is now beginning to become more attuned to excellence and more buried in the sort of academic fair that it's, uh, that, that it's willing to offer. So I think that's a very optimistic thing that's going on. I think in, in politics, I don't see anything very optimistic uh, in terms of the Conservative Party, in terms of the quality of people going in. I think we do have a real problem with supply of, of good people. Um, I think Brexit, I would say, is a huge problem there. But I think also the quality of life of politicians is is problematic. You know, they're they're widely vilified, they're widely insulted, and I think with the this re recent appalling uh, murder, I think there is a real sense of whether people want to go into this. I've talked to a number of people in the last week who say, "I'm just not sure I can keep doing this." You know, this is creating a chilling effect on the supply of of, of people. So um, I think politics is a big problem, but there is there is something going on in our educational sector which gives me hope for the, the, the future of a meritocratic revival. And I do think that although it's become a little bit of a cliche and it's become a little bit vague in terms of its formulation, the notion of levelling up um, does have some real possibilities in it. You know, what, when Boris keeps saying that talent is equally distributed across the country, but opportunity is not, there's a lot of truth in that. And I think the idea of spreading, of bringing opportunity to the whole of the country, uh, the idea of leveling up, very Tory notion, leveling up rather than leveling down, of, of giving everybody who, who has aspiration and ability an opportunity to prosper, I think is a very key idea. And the Tories could develop it into, into something that will be a guiding principle over the next few years if they can, they can work hard at it. So I'm not entirely pessimistic about the future, but I am very disillusioned with the quality of our of our leadership class of our political class I, i'll stop there and i should say um, i'd love questions on 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 meritocracy um it's a passion of mine i'm fascinated by it but anything else that you want to ask um that might be relevant to somebody who writes about politics for a living and spends their time hanging around the house of commons i'd be very pleased as long as it doesn't involve predicting precise details of next week's budget thank you can we start with, Adrian, the um, defining mission, as it's called, of this government, which is levelling up? Yep. We now have a government department for levelling up, uh, clumsily called Deleu Hook, or something yes. like that, <clears throat> headed by Michael Gove. And to quote it, it's central, it's to drive the government's central mission to unite and level up every part of the UK. Andy Haldane, the former chief economist of the Bank of England, is on secondment for six months, but they obviously think it's a great job if it's all they get, <laughs> uh, to the cabinet office to head a levelling up task force, quote, to lead the government's efforts to raise living standards, spread opportunity, improve public services, and restore people's sense of pride in their communities all in six months. Uh, so my, I have three questions related to that introduction on levelling up. And I'm going to give you the three now and you can decide how to answer them. The first is, do you think that this will help build a meritocracy and the, bene and the benefits to be derived from it in this country? The second is, on the other hand, will parentage and money continue to dominate the merit stakes absent a desirable level of churn for pulling down barriers to maintain the merits at the top and the meritful at the bottom. And then the third question is, is Michael Gove, who has said he's a fan of your book uh, and who believes in meritocracy, um, but who says that our system has become 
addled and rigged, as he put it, with wealth and influence, is he the right man in the right place to lead us towards it? Yep, all, all very good questions. I would say that um, on, on levelling up, I think another way of levelling up, of thinking about levelling up, is to think about what I term the meritocracy gap. I think what we have is a big gap in this country between a meritocratic elite, which is very successful, very committed to getting ahead and getting its children get ahead, uh, letting its children get ahead, and very committed broadly to meritocratic values. Um, and then at, at the bottom of society, uh, there's a big gap between them and people at the bottom of society who have fewer opportunities, who are not necessarily as committed to meritocracy. They see the opportunities being very divorced from their lives um, and live in a world where sort of um, educational institutions, improving institutions don't exist um, anymore. You know, they live in a world where the central institutions in their societies are not libraries or schools. They might well be even you know rather seedy bars or tanning salons or, or 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 gambling joints or things like that if you go to a lot of inner city areas you know they're denuded of culture and i think what we need to do is to close that meritocracy gap by by by, by to close the meritocracy gap by, by creating um more opportunities more links between the the top and the bottom of society through um, uh, I would say the, the, the academies would be one. I would say schools, the, the public schools, uh, by which I mean independent schools, taking you know, a more proactive role in, in improving um, state schools, twinning with them, sharing their facilities with them, sharing their, their expertise with them, but also reigniting meritocratic institutions in you know the old uh, working class culture if you go back and look at working class culture in the early 20th century it was dominated by friendly societies by the workers educational association by local libraries there were local autodidact workers who who, who were self educated there was a, a, a the churches there was a culture of self respect and somehow as a combination of egalitarianism and commercial culture that working class culture has been destroyed. And of course, the, the, you know, the, the, the flattening of a, a lot of the working class. And you go to, 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 to let's say you go to, 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 to inner port, in a city Portsmouth, uh, um, down the road from, from, from me, um, and you find a culture which just doesn't have any um, lighthouses in it. So I would say, you know, you know improving schools but also, you know, making sure that libraries aren't closed down, making sure that that, that, that self-help institutions flourish, making that chari sure that charities have a role. So I think that what I say levelling up is more um, a matter of reigniting working class sort of aspiration and, as well as providing opportunity. On the subject of Michael Gove, um, I say absolutely. Michael Gove is a really, really good man at getting things done. He's intellectually very able. He's a very good speaker, but he's a very dynamic minister. And every ministry that he has been part of, he has shaken up. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a bolt of electricity. Right. But don't you think that there is a danger that um, the government's levelling up policy will lead to even more centralization yes. in a highly centralized nation. Whereas what you were talking about just now was really about localism. Yes. Don't we need a radical decentralization of power and money in this country? There's a huge debate within the governments um, about whether leveling up as it were should be imposed from Whitehall or whether it should grow from the bottom up. Um, and the distinct impression, I, uh, you know, somebody like, somebody like Dominic Cummings was very critical of local government and it was very much a sort of top down uh, person. But the impression that I got from the, the Conservative Conference in Manchester was that the shift of uh, consensus uh, within the party and within the parts of the party that are thinking about this was towards devolution that this has to come from the bottom up. I was struck by the ministers such as Neil O'Brien, who's very, very bright, Michael himself, 
um, emphasizing that they needed to devolve powers, but also I was struck by the number of people they had at the conference who were basically local leveling up warriors, people who had a, a real uh, history of improving local institutions. Now, I know that the treasury is very, very difficult, and I know that we have a long tradition of centralization in this country, but I do get the sense that the Conservative Party as a party is putting its weight at the moment behind devolution. And that I do, as I say, Michael is a very formidable person, uh, Minister, and he's, um, I think he's a general, a genuine localizer, not a, not a, not a treasury person. I think he'll have to take on the treasury when he yeah, wants to. Yeah, it is, to absolutely, that. absolutely. Um, okay, um, let me just um, move us on to another topic then, which is um, the government talking about, um, you know, global Britain, um, uh, higher wages, higher growth, higher productivity economy. They seem to be saying that the way to produce that is through Brexit. I mean, that's certainly what Boris Johnson was saying in his conference speech. Not through meritocracy, not through levelling up, but through Brexit, through the actual effect of Brexit. And although there is, as Johnson says, turbulence in the short term, there will be a payoff. Um, so he's not looking to a meritocracy to revolutionise Britain. He's looking to Brexit. I think that's right, but I think that's um, I think that's what they look at, and they think that the, the Brexit, by cutting off cheap labour, and by giving the system a shock, will um, improve things. I think it might improve things. I think it equally well might make things a lot worse by by you know if we've already got a, a situation where whereby the what global supply chains are constrained making them even more constrained. I do think that Boris is, has his heart in the right place on the, the meritocracy issue. I think, you know, he is a scholarship boy himself. Um, he wasn't somebody who had sort of, he wasn't an Etonian with huge landed estates. He was an Etonian who was good at doing exams. And I do think that um, there are lots of things that we could do um, that wouldn't necessarily be that expensive um, in order to uh, you know, open up opportunities. I would say that the public schools, the, the independent schools, um, you know, they enjoy charitable status and they should be forced to earn charitable status a bit more by admitting a lot more people from the state system. And I think it would, I think it would be also not that difficult to recreate a lot of the direct grant grammar schools like Manchester Grammar School and, and King Edward's School uh, Birmingham again, which I think could be in, an integral part of the leveling up program because process, because these were incredibly good at finding and educating talent, you know, in the north and in the Midlands. And um, you know, the mechanism is not that expensive. It just means that the, the state pays for people to go to these schools rather than going to other schools. Right. There are many points there on which we do have questions. Um, but can I go to a comment that you made in one of your columns recently, yep. which was that Brexit transformed Britain by tapping into ordinary people's resentment of distant elites. Yep. And my question really is, is that resentment directed to the UK or is it directed to the EU establishment? Um, and is it new? Or is it that the 2016 referendum provided a unique opportunity for a kind of revolt of the masses? The, the, the 2016 referendum did provide a unique opportunity for the revolt of the masses. And for my own part, I think having a referendum was a very, very bad idea. I don't think we, I, I don't like referendums. Uh, I certainly didn't like a ref, that referendum on that very, very complicated and nuanced question. Um, but I do think that the revolt of the masses against the cognitive elite is not just a British thing. It's something that we're seeing you know, right around the world. Trump was obviously the most extraordinary and grotesque example of this. It happened at the same time. And he was, you know, he was on the side of what he, he as he said, I love the I love the uneducated. You know, he actually said that in one of his speeches. He was you know, representing you know, blue collar America against uh, the America of Harvard and Yale and Stanford and the rest of it. 
Um, so I think it is a, a general phenomenon. I think we are now seeing it as well. You know, you're seeing it in France in a very powerful way, both in the in the coming uh, election and in the you know in, in the sort of mass populist uprisings that we 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 we've, we've seen the Gilets Jaunes uh, and, and the rest of it. So I think it is a, a more general phenomenon, and there are good reasons why it's happening. Uh, because the living standards of less educated people have been stagnant uh, for a very, very long time, that the people who've borne the biggest brunt of globalization are manufacturing workers, and educated people have been pulling further and further ahead in terms of their income and also their, their social, um, in terms of the stability of their incomes in the long term, and also the, as well as their absolute incomes. So I think, we, and also one of the things that does worry me is the way that the working classes, as it were, have been squeezed out of the British political system, that the number of people with a working class background has been going down. We talk an enormous amount about the increase in the number of women in Parliament, uh, which is, of course, something to be celebrated. But that's gone along with Parliament becoming an almost all graduates institution with very few representatives um, of the working class, particularly of the sort of uh, the new working class of, uh, of temp workers and, and things like that. So although I do believe very strongly in meritocracy, I also think that we need to improve the representativeness of our representative institutions. They, 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 they've become a bit out of touch with large chunks of society. Right. Uh, <laughs> this divided society that yep. we're referring to uh, there's a tweet from Dr. Simon Ubsdell, which reads, Our society has become coarse, brutal, divided, anxious, angry, fearful, ill-informed, gullible, confused. And then he adds exactly how the regime wants it to be. Well, he comes from his position. Um, many things and especially social media seem to be acting as a kind of centrifugal force, driving us apart into warring tribes. So my question really is, do you agree that there is some kind of a coarsening taking place in our society? And if we did manage to control the deleterious effects of social media, might meritocracy properly applied, play a role in bringing us together as a liberal democracy, freeing us up to follow our individual and collective destiny? I think absolutely there's been a coarsening of, of, of our society. Um, and um, I think particularly there's been a coarsening of working class society, of, um, you know, the work, working class society, if you go back to the late 19th, and early 20th century, it was a society that was characterized by you know extraordinarily powerful institutions of self-improvement you know friendly societies um uh, religious uh, organizations and it was characterized by um it was dominated by an elite of self-educated people people who really believed in education not just because of the utility of education but because of the nobility of, of education that tradition is a very very powerful tradition and i think that was destroyed um, it has been destroyed since since the Second World War almost entirely. It's become a much coarser society with the, you know, the, the pop music, with very vulgar sort of pop music, and entertainment, which is which is reaching for the lowest common denominator. There's a marvelous book um, called Poverty Safari, and what Poverty Safari demonstrates about a, is by actually a Glaswegian rapper. Um, and what, poverty, what, what it demonstrates is that a lot of people at the bottom of British society are brought up in a world which is just very unpleasant. You know, it doesn't have any cultural standards. It's just dragged down to the very bottom. And I think that we need to have a collective effort in decoarsening society. The BBC used to be an agent of, of moral improvement with Lord Reith and the rest of it. It isn't anymore. People don't like this idea of being preachy. I think we need to be preachy. I think we do need to be preachy. This, this coarsening of society is, uh, is a problem in itself and it's a massive problem for social mobility. And I think part of what, what reviving meritocracy would be about would be about reviving a culture of self-respect and of aspiration.
And I think, you know, we, we've lost that too much, but I'm, I'm sounding like an old fuddy-duddy. Okay, can we move on to education again? Uh, we Peter, have a number of questions. Peter, Peter could, I, could I just slip in a question there? Because yep. I would like Adrian to say a bit more about the media, not so much the social media yeah. as the newspapers and the broadcast media. Surely they could play some part in improving the, the working class um, characteristics, would you say? Yeah, I say to, to, it was saying improving the working class characteristics, and I know I introduced this language. It can sound a bit sort of condescending, but I do think <laughs> I do think there is there, there is there, there is a there is a real problem there. And yes, the the, the media could do that. So I don't think you can um, you can't force people to read the Times rather than the Sun. Um, <laughs> but I do think the BBC does have an educative role. I think part of its license to operate is the idea that it that tries to communicate the best um, that has been thought and said um, to ordinary people. And I hate this tendency that the BBC has to say, uh, we've got to create, you know, R Radio One uh, and various subversions of Radio One for, 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 for working class people and for younger people. Um, what it should be to trying to do is to get them interested in great books and great literature and great music rather than just chopping up the audience. I do think that, 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 that you know, Twitter and the, the social media are pretty ghastly um, in lots of ways, but they're, they're, you know, they're, they're immensely fragmented. I think it's only the BBC that has the massive, massive resources to, um, to engage in this. And you know, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's making, because I think, it's, I think the, the elite has lost its cultural confidence. It thinks that if it, it you know, it thinks that saying the sort of things that I'm saying about uh, uh, about elevating the tone of the country is is reactionary and fuddy duddy and middle class and the rest of it. And I think if we lose our cultural confidence, we we let the loudest and most vulgar voices win. Thank you. I, I exclude the economists from any implied criticism. <laughs> which I subscribe to and are excellent. Excellent, thank on you. Edu on education, Adrian, uh, we have a couple of questions, one from Anna Beria, one from Anne Davidson, about the school system. Yeah. And um, the point they're, they're making is that the percentage of primary and secondary school children at private schools remains at around 7% or so of the total. But, their pupils appear to secure a quite disproportionate number of top professional positions. Um, you talked about in your remarks earlier about the um, public schools, i.e. private schools, working with state schools, but they are going further and kind of pressing you to wonder whether should this free market approach actually be allowed to continue or should we really underline invest in the state education system and find ways to phase out private education, despite the fact that that would add to the cost to the exchequer? And maybe I could add to that, what other changes would you make in the pre-university educational system to foster a more meritocratic approach? Well, I, I think that the, the, the phasing out of private education, I think for reasons of freedom and for reasons that private schools are in many ways embodiments of excellence is not the way I would go. I think one of the things that's happened, uh, what I'd much rather see is to start off with putting excellence and the, uh, uh, and the pursuit of academic excellence at the heart of state education. And what we had was, a comprehensive movement in this country, which is part of a more general revolt against standards and excellence and in favor of mixed ability teaching and progressive teaching and letting everybody do what they want to. Um, uh, you know, it was very much sort of 1960s ethos. And I think that that destroyed something very powerful within the state, state sector. And we have to remember that, that you, know, for, for, you know, for a long time after the Second World War, state schools were gaining on private schools in terms of admission to Oxbridge 
and all that that entails in terms of getting into the elite. So we were, we were getting an elite that was becoming much more open. More people from ordinary backgrounds were going to grammar schools and getting to Oxbridge and then going on to dominate the professions. And many people in the state, in the private sector, thought that the private schools were doomed um, because they weren't competing very well with grammar schools. And indeed, the proportion of people going to parents who were sending their children, to, to, uh, children who were going to private schools, declined to about 4%, I think, in the, uh, in the 1970s, because parents didn't think it was worth it. They thought they were you know, spending a lot of money for education that wasn't getting them what they wanted. So we were seeing British society genuinely opening up. I think that, so you do two things, I think, to compensate for that. One is reignite the principle, the spirit of excellence within the public school system. And I think the academies amongst other schools are doing that. But secondly, I think that we need to, to, to make the, 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 the border between grammar, between the state sector and the private sector much more porous. I'm very keen on re recreating direct grant schools you know, like Manchester Grammar School and, uh, and, and the, the, Edward the Sixth School in Birmingham, which I think were fantastic schools. But I would also say that public schools, uh, by which I mean independent schools, private schools, should be compelled to take a more substantial proportion of their pupils from poor backgrounds. Remember, these schools were founded, Winchester was founded to educate the children of the poor, poor scholars. Eton was founded for the same purpose. Uh, all of these schools were founded to take the children of poor people and turn them into ser servants of the state or the church. But now um, they basically educate the children of bankers because they're the only people who can afford them, plus foreign, you know, foreigners, you know, uh, people who come from abroad. I think that a third of borders now in, in British public schools uh, are the children of parents who live abroad. And that cannot be justified in terms of, you know, their tax exempt status, their charitable status cannot be uh, justified if they're not educating a significant number of people. Winston Churchill in 1944 said that he predicted that after the Second World War, after the, after, once the war had ended, Eton and Harrow would have to take 60 or 70 percent of their children from the state sector. And I think that uh, I think we should at the very least expect them to take about 50 percent from the from poor, poor backgrounds, poor scholars, which is the historical role. Very good. Can we, uh... Talking about schools, can we just move on to the curriculum? Yeah. Um, I think we were, many of us were struck when David Cameron said that one of his favourite books as a child was Our Island Story, which um, taught him about um, Britain's successes. Um, and the question really is, do you think the school curriculum should fake focus more on the humanities like comparative history, economics, law, religion, and culture to prepare future generations better to understand the world and the continent they live in. And if we do do that, then what would we have to take out of the curriculum? At the moment, there is a great focus on literacy and mathematics and science, all very admirable subjects, but I'm not sure it teaches citizens about the realities of their history and the options that their country has. Um, let, let me answer that and let me ask, also answer a question I've just seen in the chat there, which I thought was a very uh, serious and important question. First, uh, it's not just Cameron who loves our island story. Boris loves our island story as well. It seems to be what, you know, they were taught at Eton. They spent all of this money and what they got was this rather hack uh, book about uh, uh, from the early 20th century. But I think that um, it's very important um, that we should have high quality teaching of the humanities as well as high quality teaching of the sciences. And I don't think that uh, we can sacrifice sacrifice high quality teaching of the humanities, particularly history and English literature. I think there's far too much focus in schools on peripheral subjects such as 
such as films and media studies and all of that, which I would get rid of in total. I, I would focus on the real hardcore humanities and the real hardcore uh, sciences um, in, in, in the academic side of the curriculum. Um, and what worries me most is a decontextualizing of, um, there's a lot of focus now on the evils that Britain did in its past. And, um, you know, particularly slavery. Um, and I think it's right to some extent that, 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 that these evils should be noted. Um, and it's right that Britain's history should be prevent, presented in all of its multifaceted um, nature. But I think we need some sort of context that, you know, Britain wasn't the only country that had um, engaged in the slave trade. The slave trade wasn't something invented by Britain or invented by capitalist society. It was something that had been endemic in human history. And in fact, Britain abolished the slave trade. You know, Britain played a progressive role here. Um, you know, many, you know, s s s African societies, Arabian societies um, engaged in massive slave trade, slave slavery and slave trading, as indeed did the ancient world. So I do think that ultimately we should be taught a sense of pride in our in our history because we did create the Industrial Revolution, which was the big, big turning point in human history in terms of in terms of economic growth. Up until the Industrial Revolution, economic growth had been essentially flat. This created a boom in growth, which led to led to mass prosperity. And we did create parliamentary institutions, which uh, constrained the power of the executive and represented people. I do actually subscribe ultimately to a Whig notion that, 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 that our history, at least, has been a history of progress. So I think I don't want to have our island story. That is a jingoistic sort of history. But I don't think we ought to go to the opposite extreme and, and just teach only about the, the, the bad things that, that the British um, or indeed the Europeans have done, because I think Britain and indeed Europe has been an engine of enlightenment uh, more, more than anything else. I saw a question at the bottom, which I do want to address because it's a very profound question. And that is, what do we do about people who aren't part of the academic elites? And I have focused a great deal on the uh, academic elite, but I should say that um, we have to cater for the full range of abilities. Uh, and we have to understand that, there are, that academic ability is not the only thing that matters uh, and indeed, traditionally in many ways it's been overrated there is technical ability engineering ability practical ability and there is also caring you know and you know one of the biggest growth professions in our society will be the caring professions i think one of the great problems with british education is that we used to have a system of selection by elimination we would find the academic elite send them off to these great institutions of oxford and cambridge and more or less forget about everybody else and what we have to do is replace selection by uh, elim uh, by different uh, elimination with selection by differentiation. So have technical schools, technical colleges, vocational schools, and also schools that focus on, on, on caring and also change our system of values to put more emphasis on the extraordinary importance of these other forms of excellence or ability. And I would point here very strongly to Germany, which has a tremendously successful um, vocational system of education, whereby many people who do academically very well say, no, I want, to, I want to be an engineer. I want to go down this vocational route and focus on, on vocational things. I like making things uh, and doing that. And also we need to do a lot more to develop caring um, qualities and care, caring professions, because if we look at the aging of our society, this is you know, gonna be a massive, massive uh, growth area. So, you know, absolutely, that was a very fine question and we need a differentiated education system. I have noticed, I've been traveling around the country a bit recently and I have noticed both in Portsmouth and in Newcastle, spanking new technical schools uh, being built. So I think there is some attempts now to increase the supply of, of technical education and some sense that this is, you know, a very valid thing, that this is not just a poor, a thing that you do when you fail to, to do Latin at A-level or something like that. My understanding is that the German example continues to this day. Absolutely. Um, the Gymnasium, the Technical Hochschule, the Realschule, and they have never, I believe, suffered from the kind of um, 
you know, you're either a success or you're a failure at 11 plus uh, when when the decision is taken. Uh, they seem to have got round that um, in, in a very admirable way, which we have never managed to uh, emulate. Absolutely. Um, uh, we, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, and it's a sort of a lot of it is to do with status that we think that abstract things, abstract re reasoning is high status and doing things with your hands, making things um, is low status. Uh, and that's a very peculiar sort of overhang from an aristocratic society. And the Germans don't seem to have had that problem. So it's not just that they have these schools. Um, it's that they that, that, that they uh, they ascribe a status to technical work, uh, to working you know in these middle stand companies that make doors or or or, or, or make locks or make um, you know stereos or, or or make headphones, which we don't seem to do. Um, and when the gov the gov country the government is talking about leveling up, I think it could do very few things better than to look at the German middle stand companies to look at German technical education, to look at the stability of that system. You know, Michael Gove speaks very eloquently of saying we shouldn't have a country which means that you have to leave the place you love to, you know, to, 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 to live the dream that you, that you have. Well, we are that country and Germany isn't, and Germany isn't that country because it's got this huge um, reserve of middle-sized companies in every single town, right spread right across the country. And we need to recreate those those things at the moment. You know, everything's focused on London, Oxford, Cambridge, the Golden Triangle, um, and everything's focused on abstract academic cognitive success. Uh, I mean, not academic maybe, success. maybe not exactly the moment, Adrian, for us to um, be seen to be emulating good practice, best practice on the continent. Um, let me move on to a related subject which Monica has raised, which is not just IQ, but EQ. And she says, you know, people like Dominic Cummings and Steve Bannon are undoubtedly intelligent and able, but they see politics purely as a game to be won or lost. How do we encourage more emotional intelligence in politics? And it doesn't have to be just in politics where those in power see the consequences of their actions, she asks. So is EQ part of your theory of the doctrine of meritocracy? I think that we do need to put more. I, I, I do think that, I, you know, I've said some sceptical things about what's happened to, to education since the Second World War, um, particularly with the abolition of selective schools and the comprehensive movement, which focuses so much on equality. But I do think in terms of emotional education, we are in a better place now than we've been before. I think that children are looked after better. They're encouraged to empathize um, much more than they used to be. And that we have raised the collective EQ of the country. Um, but I think we need, we don't need to, we, we need to, I think to balance back a bit more towards a more traditional um, approach to education, for, at least for academic high flyers, but we don't need to lose that EQ side of things. And I do, it's, it's horribly stereotyped to say this, but I do think that the increase in the number of women in parliament has shifted, you know, parliament, parliamentary culture a bit more towards more emotional intelligence and a bit away from the sort of Cummings, Bannon sort of, battling for, 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 for success. But I do think that, that you know, that, that, that the biggest growth area in jobs will be um, caring jobs. And that is obviously, you know, they're absolutely vital to, you know, that quality is absolutely vital to, to that sector, clearly. Uh, talking about intelligence, um, you described in one of your pieces in The Economist, as or might have been some other magazine you've written in, um, Boris Johnson as our Alpha yes. Gamma yes. Prime Minister. I'm wondering if you could explain to us his Alpha and his Gamma attributes, and also uh, tell us whether you think it was meritocracy that led him to an 80-seat majority and continual favor continued favourable polling or the reverse of meritocracy? 
Very good. When I said he was Alpha Gamma, I think that that's, well, I wrote it, so I believe it, but I do think it's absolutely right that Boris is exceptionally good at some things. He's very good at making people feel good about themselves. Um, and that's valuable in a politician. He's also, more importantly, he's been very, very good at seizing the moment. Uh, he seized the Brexit moment um, with extraordinary skill and turned himself from somebody who would never have been prime minister, um, you know, who was disapproved of by much of his party, who was regarded as the man you didn't want your daughter to be driven home by, by, you know, right across the party, who didn't really have a big parliamentary debate, to be the inevitable, you know, healer of the Conservative uh, uh, rift. So I think, you know, that was an extraordinary quality, the quality of being able to judge the way that history is moving. That, those are the qualities of really the first, first rate politicians. Mrs. Thatcher was another person who saw in the late 1970s that this couldn't go on and we couldn't continue to, to compromise with the forces of disorder and that we had to shift, we had to change the way that Britain was, was governed. And I think Boris saw history changing um, and, uh, 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 and responded to that in an opportunistic way, but also a very clever way. Um, but when it comes to delivery, um, he is much more gamma the, than, than that. I mean, I think the initial response to the pandemic was appalling. Um, he's disappearing on holiday or going to checkers or failing to see the significance of what was going on was appalling. Many people would be alive now who are not alive if we'd had Jeremy Hunt as prime minister rather than Boris. Um, I have no doubt about that. Um, and he can he can just make appalling um, errors of, of, of judgment in what he says in his personal life um, and in all sorts of things. So he's very much an, a, a, an alpha uh, gamma figure. But I think on the issue of meritocracy, I think that, that this is, this is slightly speculative here, but we had this huge populist upsurge around the world, particularly in the United States and Britain. In the United States, what happened was it basically broke the Republican Party, and the Republican Party is now held prisoner by a lunatic, essentially, uh, in, in the form of Trump, and it cannot now operate as a responsible governing party. The Conservative Party saw this populist upsurge and decided either it could fight it um, and try and prevent it, um, or it could put itself at the head of it and try and guide it in the right direction. And it has succeeded in remaining the governing party whilst incorporating all of this radical uh, Brexit populist energy. And it's not, it's not completely different from what happened with the rise of the sort of industrial middle class in the 19th century when the Conservative Party decided not to fight it, but to put itself at the head of it under, under Peel with the Corn Laws. Uh, and in not, it's not that different from what happened um, after the Second World War when the Conservative Party could have said no to the welfare state, we believe in the free market, but it actually incorporated the, the, the welfare state and, and, and Churchill simply inherited Attlee's uh, legacy and, 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 and consolidated it. So there is a sort of cunning to the Conservative Party, of which Boris is a representative, that says, you know, if the people are revolting, you don't try and fight them, you try and lead them in, 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 in the right direction. And that is one interpretation of, of what happened with Brexit. Do you see Brexit, Edwin, as the, you know, versus Remain um, Europe, as the new divide uh, in our politics, nationalist versus liberal preferences and so on, or do you see that that will actually fade away and our politics will revert to being one based on different views from left and right on uh, the way society should work? I know that many, many people um in the audience will disagree with me very strongly about this, but I think that Brexit is over. Um, I think that we will not rejoin the European Union. Um, not that the European Union would necessarily want us. Um, and that Brexit 
is going to fade as a dividing line between people for many reasons, partly because uh, politicians don't want to keep fighting the old battle. So Keir Starmer is an obvious example of this, you know, very passionate anti-Brexiteer who's now accepted it and is now not going to re re refight that battle. But also b b because um, the Conservative Party at the moment is not acting like a sort of like a Nigel Farage party. It's mixing elements of Brexitism with elements of liberalism in a very interesting and complicated way. So Boris is pro-globalization, but also pro-Brexit. Uh, he's Boris is in some ways very liberal. They're very liberal in terms of you know lifestyle issues. You know he's the embodiment of liberalism in lifestyle issues. He's a libertine when it comes to lifestyle issues. So he is not a sort of classic right wing conservative. And indeed, when it comes to public spending, he's invading Labour territory. So I think that, that we're not going to have a dividing line between Brexiteers and anti Brexiteers. Brexit will fade. And the dividing line in British politics is becoming very, very complicated because we have a very red Toryism now, a very Labour-like Toryism, and we have the Labour Party, which we haven't talked about very much, but which is a very interesting state, uh, you know, abandoning, not being a pro-European party now, but becoming the party that is preoccupied by regaining the Red Wall. So Brexit is Brexit is not the... I think the, the, the dividing line will be much more about competence in the future uh, than anything else. Boris will be, um, Keir Starmer wants to fight it on competence. He wants to say, I want to keep, a, I want to keep Britain out of Europe. I want to do more in terms of leveling up, of looking after the north of England, but I'm competent. I can do it. And Boris is not competent. That'll be the next election. Right. I mean, uh, on the Labour Party. Peter, can, can I interrupt again very briefly? Um, surely, Adrian, there is something rather artificial going on in the in the way we are treating Europe, we are sort of partly pretending they don't exist. We are partly being hostile to them to keep up a running battle, and and that seems to me completely bogus, completely artificial. So, do you think that will diminish in time? I think that for the average voter now, Europe is an issue which doesn't exist, you know, which has been solved. Now for, pol for the political class, <laughs> we, have to, we have to live with Europe, we have to negotiate with it all the time. All of, you know, Brexit is not completed. Brexit is gonna take 10, 10, 20 years to, to deal with all of these details. Um, so it's, it's, it's full-time job for a certain section of the, uh, of the politicians. But when it comes to the election, when it comes to squabbling about power, it won't be at the center of our politics in the way that it has been for, you know, the last 30, uh, 30 years, are we being childish? Um, yes, probably we are. I think Frost is probably childish. Uh, and I think the Northern Ireland issue, they just, Boris solved it by ignoring it. And it is a real, real problem. Um, but I don't think it's going to galvanize voters. I think it's going to galvanize negotiators. The other thing, uh, of course, that we have now is, um, you know, issues within Europe itself. We have the Polish question now. Uh, and much more importantly, we have the French election next year. And, you know, Macron is really quite unpopular. If the, if the right does manage to unite, um, which is a big if, but if it does, you know, we, and if uh, we, we, you know, Britain, Britain's issues may become very secondary of importance as, as France enters a, a really big election with 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 with, with a, a revanchist right against against a quite a you know a strangely weak incumbent president i mean he's the incumbent president because the right has been either too extreme or too too divided and if they can unite we will have a very interesting year okay chris hammond picked up your remarks about brussels and that kind of inward cliquey nature yeah and he wonders whether the conference on the future of europe is a chance to influence the community in in that regard i hope so I, but i think they have a long long record of not listening uh to people i personally you know on the on the, on the brexit issue i was i was against leaving the european union i you know i voted to remain but I'm also very worried about the, the willingness, the unwillingness of Europe to listen 
and its willingness to override um, democratic votes because it thinks it knows better. And by this insistence that there are these four freedoms which are unnegotiable, I do not think that the issue of the mobility of human beings, labor mobility, should have should be regarded as an unnegotiable issue. Um, and I think they should have been willing to adapt. That, you know, we were foolish, but they were also foolish not to have been more flexible, particularly on that issue, because English speaking countries naturally att attract large numbers of, of immigrants. So, I mean, Blair was absolutely idiot idiotic not to have, uh, you know, made use of this break. But I think there were errors of, on both sides. Our er error was to unleash the populist um, hordes, but their error was to be an inward looking self-satisfied clique actually. And, um, you know, I wish they'd reformed. Right. Going back to the Labour Party and getting yeah. back to power. Yeah. Um, we have two questions. Mark Johnston uh, asks whether PR uh, or another similar voting system might make a difference and can it be realized? Uh, and you have written that meritocracy offers Labour's only path to victory. Could you kind of respond to both of those? Sure. The, the PR kind of electoral alliance um, um, aspect and the road to meritocracy as Labour's victory card. Sure. Um, the PR thing, I'm not a PR person. Um, for for many reasons, but um, one of them is that um, the existing parties are not going to change because they're the victors of the current system, but they have a couple of good reasons for not changing. One is that, that I think under the current system, it the current system has a crunchiness about it that means that you get clear results most of the time, um, which PR systems don't seem to have. There's endless negotiations amongst professional politicians to, to, see, to, to see who, who, who how their coalitions are, are formed. Um, and secondly, I think that the, the, the close, the first past the post system that we have does create a very, very close relationship between the MP and his constituency, which we saw with Sir David Amos. You know, he was a, a local constituency who really did feel very deeply um, and was very deeply attached to his constituents. And I think that's not something that I want to see see weakened and, under a system which uses party lists and, and things like that. On the issue of the Labour Party, I think the Labour Party after the Second World War was a dominant party because it stood for meritocracy, because it stood for upward mobility, um, for ordinary people getting their fair share and for the drones of society to be removed out from positions of power. And I think that's an incredibly um, powerful message. I think Keir Starmer is a meritocrat. I think Keir Starmer would be a very good articulator of that message. But the problem is that the current Labour Party, as it's constituted, could not argue for that case because it's, um, men, many of its members would regard that as, that, that as, as, as repugnant. I think that's a, a, it's unfortunate, but there's, a big public sector trade union part. There's a big woke part of the Labour Party who regard all notions of individual differences and human excellence as, as, as sort of the social constructs. Um, and there's, the, 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 you know, the hard left. I was at the Labour Party conference and the hard left, you know, was beaten, but it's still a very, very powerful force within the Labour Party. I mean, it's still a very powerful force. And, you know, they believe in the class struggle. Um, they believe that this is an illegitimate capitalist system. Um, so I, I think it's a pity because I think the, there was a moment when both parties were competing on create, turning Britain into an opportunity society. And that's the sort of grounds I think they should be competing on. But I don't see the Labour Party as moving in that direction. Although, you know, I, I think Keir Star, Starmer is a very decent man. I think Rachel Reeves is, is, is a, a good and innovative um, Chancellor, um, and I think there's some good people. You know, there are good people in the in the Labour Party, and you know, it needs to be rewarded for getting rid of Corbyn. But um, I think that they'll lose the next election, and the Tories will win again. But Adrian, if that hard left was a separate party and got a proportional number of votes, whatever that might be, 
then they might have to negotiate. I mean, I don't see anything wrong in the, for instance, the negotiating the Germans are doing now, that's at political level, which is hopefully elevated above the ordinary man in the streets level. And, and a bit of compromise comes out of that. And, and, and it also means that the people in parliament are proportional, representative compared to, to the vote. I, it seems to me much better and, and an awful lot of European countries, almost all European countries, as I'm sure you know, do some, something like that. Well, I think firstly, you know, our tradition is our tradition, and I think we should abandon our tradition with uh, with caution, uh, because it's woven into our history and the way we do things. And you know, we can't. You know, I I, I know I'm being slightly contradictory here because I think I said we could learn a great deal from the German system of education, but you can't just go around the world and choose, you know, the bits of different systems that you like and bring them together. There's something about you know that what works in one country may not work in another country. Um, but secondly, I think, you know, there's a great deal of anxiety in this country, which led to Brexit about smoke filled rooms and deals being done by professional politicians. And I think what our system does is to give to people, people the sense that they can vote the buggers out and that the system, you know, they have their own MP, they have their own vote, the way their vote is cast can mean, you know, they shifted from Labour to Tory and look, the, 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 the Tories are, 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 are in power and Labour's out as, as, as happened in the late, in the early, you know, 1979, you know, when large numbers of people did shift their vote. Whereas if you have a PR system, it always seems to be the same people negotiating with each other, you know, and it would be Nick Clegg and something like that. So I think those systems can create a lot of frustration um, uh, as well, and, uh, and the German temperament is, is different from ours, you know. So um, I'm frustrated. I see your I, point. I mean, I can see. I'm, your, I'm I can frustrated, see and I can't vote the buggers out. <laughs> I used to have Sam Gema, an excellent man. He is, yeah. You know, Sam and, is, Sam and is the yes. terrible. He's gone anyway. Yeah, I I, I, I do you. agree with that. I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm a liberal Tory, you know, but I, uh, um, but. On the other hand, you know, we voted for Brexit, and so everything <laughs> followed from that. Um, somebody has said, Jay Mandel, that it's not beyond the realms of probability to foresee Brexit being finally done when the UK has broken up. Yeah. Um, absolutely. This is the sort of the the great unmentioned so far, which is the breakup of the United Kingdom. I think that would be a terrible tragedy. Um, and if Brexit were to have led to the breakup of the United Kingdom, then that would you know, be a complete condemnation of the, uh, uh, of the whole process, uh, you know, the ultimate condemnation of the whole process, as it were. I don't, at the moment, I'm erring towards thinking that it won't happen. Firstly, because I think that um, Boris just won't give them the vote. And secondly, because I think that, you know, you did have a big spike in, a, in the opinion polls um, with about 56 people, 56% of Scottish people saying that they wanted independence. It's gone down now. Um, and um, I think it's about 50, 50, a little below 50%. And I do think that if there was a serious and relentless discussion of the question of how Scotland would survive on its own, what currency it would use, whether it would be allowed to join the European Union, how difficult that would be with the Spanish, you know, in particular being so hostile uh, because of the Catalan question. I think that they might not win. And if they don't win next time, I think that's probably it, that you can't keep, 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 keep voting forever. So I just believe that I don't think Britain will break up, but it's much, much, much too close for comfort. Um, well, we've just had an entry on the chat saying Ireland will become an independent nation within 10 years because of the um, birth rate of Catholics above all. Quite possible. I mean, you mean that they'll join um, the Irish Republic? Yeah. Um, yeah. Quite possible. I think that that's more likely than that Scotland will become... Um, independence uh, again yeah I, the, the, the the demographic things 
I mean, there's the question of how much the the the, the South wants the the North of Ireland, given how much it's going to cost them to integrate the the the, the North. You know, it's a very poor part of the country. But yeah, it's more likely than Scottish independence, I would say. Yeah. Right, Adrian, I'm going to pose you a final question from Monica, and then Monica herself is going to uh, sum up and thank you for your wonderful contribution to our event this evening. Her question, uh, which she posed at the beginning of these proceedings, was, isn't one way to improve the um, performance of Parliament to pay MPs more? Yes. Um, I think that a lot of people would not like that. Um, and it is one of the problems with the very unequal development of our country, that what seems like a very reasonably modest income in uh, London um, seems like a very generous income in um poorer parts of the country. And so if, you know, if you live in Grimsby, £80,000 a year, £86,000 a year, just plus expenses, plus offices and the rest of it, does seem like a lot of money. And I think there is a great danger in, um, in alienating the public even more. But I do think there is, there's clearly a problem with the supply of talent. Um, and there's clearly a problem also with the lengths that MPs have to go to, to make, you know, to make ends meet. You know, because, you know, living in London is expensive. It's a very, very expensive city. And if you've got two homes to run, that's very, very difficult. Um, I would say that there is probably a case to be made for a more comprehensive um, reform. Um, there's the House of Lords, which is becoming increasingly indefensible and ridiculously large at the moment. I would, you know, that probably starts institutional reform with the House of Lords. I would say that, you know, do we really need 650 MPs? We have more MPs than the Americans have in the House of Representatives. And America's being slightly bigger than Britain. It's a lot of, it's a lot of MPs um, and they're very crowded in, 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 in Parliament. So there could be a case for, for increasing the size of constituencies, reducing the number of MPs, providing MPs with more support, better office facilities, uh, and also paying them not extravagantly more, but a bit more so that they're not sort of penny pinching to, 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 to live in London. But they need, they, they can't be paid the sort of money that they would be paid in the private sector. Um, because I think that that would astonish, um, you know, London pays, you know, very, very high compared with much, much of the country. I'm going to go because I have to, I have to do something, but I'm going to leave you to, uh, to discuss in my absence what I, what I should have said and <laughs> failed to say. It's very, very kind of you to invite me. Thank you very much indeed.